Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The Hawker Hurricane has gone down in popular history as, well, not the Spitfire. Sydney Cam's first monoplane fighter carried over many tried and true Hawker lines and shapes, and by the summer of 1940, the Hurricane was a stable, manoeuvrable gun platform that bore the brunt of the fighting in the Battle of Britain. The aircraft that was the RAF's first 300 mile an hour plus fighter would go on to see service in almost every theatre of the Second World War. Proving highly adaptable, it would be armed with cannons and bombs and rockets and the remarkable 40 millimeter Vickers S-gun, the tank busting can opener. Now, last year, the Imperial War Museum at Duxford had as quite stunning Spitfire Evolution exhibition, where you would be able to go and see many, many Spitfires in their various marks, including the ones that were basically just coat of paint. Don't at me for that one. Following that exhibition, we have one dedicated to the Hurricane and Flying Hurricanes at that. They have brought together half of the world's airworthy aircraft. Now, when the title of the exhibition came out, eyebrows, including mine, were raised. It is called Hurricane Unsung Hero. For those of a hawker's bent and for those of us who spend far too much time thinking about these things, we immediately took to social media to go, unsung? Really? How could you? So let's figure that one out. And who better to speak to than the woman who put it all together? Rebecca Greenwood Harding is the head of technical objects for the Imperial War Museum, which is a great title, and she literally has all the toys to play with. So Rebecca, kindly welcome Matthew Willis and I up to Duxford to take us around the exhibition, have a look at the hurricanes, and delve into that unsung bit and why it is actually quite an apt title for the show. As I had Rebecca on the spot, I also took the opportunity to delve into some of the other issues that us AV geeks probably jump on a bit quickly as we look at the tricky issue of museum disposals and whether or not they should actually be called that. And if you can, please stick around for the bit at the end, because I have something I'd like to say and I'd love to get your feedback on it as well. So without further ado, let's ask Rebecca how the idea for the exhibition came together and how did she bring all of these fantastic hurricanes together in one place? So here we are at Imperial War Museum, Duxford, Warbird Central, really. How did this idea for getting all of these fantastic hurricanes together come from? Well, as you know, last year we put on a similar exhibition, um, Spitfire Evolution of an Icon, and visitors were able to come and visit numbers of Spitfires, which clearly illustrated how the Spitfire evolved. Um, but feedback we got from some visitors was, what about the, the hurricane? Too right, too, too right. right. Too right, indeed. Feedback from other visitors when the hurricane was mentioned to them was, what's a hurricane? Um, is it as good as a Spitfire? The answer is, of course, yes, it is. Yeah, how can you say what is a hurricane? Look at it, we're, we're stood next to the glorious P3717, and out of the corner of my eye, you have snuck N3200, which is the Dunkirk Spitfire as, as well, which is what most people probably recognize it from these days. But you've snuck it in, and I think it doesn't look as pretty next to all these, all these beautiful hurricanes. No, we put um, N3200 into enabling visitors to compare the two um, and you're quite right um, though the Spitfire is very beautiful I think the Hurricane is just as beautiful too. Yes there we go. So one of the things that has come up that has been for people who probably haven't even been to the exhibition which ladies and gentlemen is fantastic and we're gonna have a wander around in a moment is the title what is it called? It is Hurricane Unsung Hero. Now for those of us of a hawker's bent we immediately went unsung oh my goodness how could you possibly say that what was the reasoning behind calling it that because it's to be fair from a marketing perspective it's perfect because it's got everybody immediately going for it but what in the context of the exhibition does unsung mean well, certainly the feedback we got from visitors last year was a uh, hurricane well that's a bit of an unsung hero and that phrase kept coming up time and time again 
and it's very clear that, like you say, there are a lot of us who are real Hawker um, fans, but there are a lot of people out there who are equally not so knowledgeable about the Hurricane. So for me, the aim of this exhibition was to try and attract all visitors and make sure that visitors of all ages and all knowledge levels would leave the exhibition feeling they'd learnt something new. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, ladies and gentlemen, because I have to do this with every podcast, is there's a Duxford has a very strong hawker's link because this is where the typhoon became operational. It is indeed, mm -hmm. uh, 1942. Yep. Uh, so we'd like to consider ourselves the home of the Spitfire, and we also like to consider ourselves home of the typhoon too. Wonderful. And also, sadly, where the first typhoon casualty was. Indeed it An was. Ar Argentinian pilot named James Deck. Correct. Overcome with carbon monoxide fumes a mile over there and over there doesn't help a listener i am pointing off to the <laughs> to the west or the east whatever direction that is so let's have a wander around and we can talk about the the fun and games that goes into collecting a whole pile of incredibly rare aircraft in one place and we're going to stand in front of matt willis's fancy camera as i had to bring a friend with me so what goes in to collecting this many aircraft of yeah, this many hurricanes when there's only sort of a dozen, 14 flying, and you've got half of them. Well, you will have half tomorrow when the Sea Hurricane arrives. We will indeed. Um, we're very fortunate here in that we have a number of very supportive uh, partners on site who operate the Hurricane. So uh, a few kind of friendly chats um, has resulted in us being able to put this uh, exhibition on. Um, for me personally, as the exhibition curator, um, it was a good opportunity to dive into the history of um, each of the aircraft. So uh, that was a, a fun few hours work for me. <laughs> and um, so from a research perspective, um, I was able to dive into the museum's collection to see what supporting material we had in the way of film and uh, photos, as you can see, a number of them are on display here in the audiovisual display, um, which I think help uh, bring the hurricanes to life. People quite often tend to associate the uh, hurricane primarily with the Battle of Britain, which, yes, mm -hmm. that, that, that's fair enough, but people are quite often surprised to find out about their role as the flying uh, can openers in, in, in the desert. Um, yes. Aircraft such as... 40 uh, millimetre S guns sung beneath the wings of them, yes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Uh, so the uh, private operators as well, um, they were able to share information with us about the history of the aircraft. So it was kind of uh, a labour of love, um, pulling it all together and put it into a nice little leaflet for our visitors to find out more fantastic i i i'm 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 super chuffed because i'm just looking around here and i'm i'm giddy so, yeah spitfire aside but you know that's we've got one two three we've got loads of them in here and it's just wonderful so let's wander around and have a look we have in front of us two hurricane heritage ones we've got b505 ladies and gentlemen available for flights from the spring check out their website but we've got a battle of britain veteran over there in r4118 yeah. and then over on the other side we've got the historic aircraft collections as well sort of pointing at each other which is quite quite nicely done yes they i can't quite decide if they're having an argument or a catch up <laughs> <laughs> now i'm better because i'm a two-seater <laughs> no i'm better because i'm a battle of britain veteran <laughs> So it, let's sort of talk about you, 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 you've delved into the archives, you've got the, the story, the, the little booklet that goes with them is, is fantastic, you've got a little write-up on each of the aircraft, but what goes in, this is going to sound a very basic question, but what goes into figuring out how to display aircraft in a way so that they feel accessible to someone who comes in? So obviously, as airworthy aircraft, we have taken into account the fact that they may need to temporarily leave the exhibition for maintenance, as in fact one has done so today. So we're trying to kind of balance practical um, considerations with um, kind of how to make them look appealing to visitors. Not that that's hard for the hurricanes, of course they're, they're appealing. It's not a bad angle on a hurricane. No, no. So we, we try to display them in a way that visitors can see that from all angles to kind of get a real appreciation of the hurricane's um, sturdy shape. 
that. Yes. And, and the thing is, it, it's one of those things with a, with a hurricane that people go, oh, it's much bigger than a Spitfire. And as you've got 3,200s out here, it's not really that much bigger. So seeing the two very famous Battle of Britain, we'll call them aircraft next to each other, in, in, in this case, one is, one almost was, um, you can really see... I don't want to say the difference, but also the similarities between the two. Correct, you can. The Hurricane, obviously, was just more traditional um, design, obviously developed from the Fury, the Spitfire, um, with very much the, the new uh, boy or girl, mm. if you prefer, uh, <laughs> on the block. And I think that's partly why the Spitfire um, got so much attention, is because it was so different. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I go back to delving into the archives here, and um, you're looking into the accounts of people like Gordon Sinclair learning to um, transit from the Gloucester Gladiator to the Spitfire, and what kind of fun and games they had um, going from this kind of very sturdy little biplane to uh, the rather feisty Spitfire, and there were certainly one or two Spitfires that ended up on their noses here at Duckwood and the pilots to uh, try to get to grip with them. But, uh, the Hurricane, I certainly haven't read so many accounts of being such a difficult bird to get to grips with. I think the Hurricane was a bit um, easier for pilots to uh, find their way around. Um, she's, she's, she's a sturdy girl. So. She is. And she, she comes from a company that makes fighters. Yeah. As opposed to flying boats and, 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 and the like, which... And racing aircraft, yeah. Yes. So she, the Hurricane has, has, a, has a really strong pedigree. Mm. And which is, which is fantastic, because we're, we're going to sort of jump around in a bit. Cause when we walk over there, you've got the Fury, you've got the Nimrod, and you've got the Hind fuselage out as well. So you can really see the, that lineage, as you're saying, that Cam did. Also, because if you keep things reasonably similar, it's cheaper to make, and that makes exactly. profits better, which keeps Tom Top with happy. Exactly. Yeah. Stick with what you know. Exactly. So let's let's wander over to this side because we have the historic aircraft collections aircraft in Polish colours, haven't we? We have indeed. And of course, the the check on the side as well for, for yeah. the OSF. But we'll 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 wander over it, and. They've just got the association with the Polish Heritage Flight as well. Correct. Which is fantastic because there's quite a connection there for there this, is this place in, in particular. Because, um, yes, during the Battle of Britain, um, we had Polish pilots um, fighting alongside their, their British counterparts and they were absolutely fantastic. They were uh, very skilled at what they did and that they deserved, they rightfully deserved the glory. It's... It's one of those things that I'm, I'm hesitating to even say this. Don't they get a lot of credit, but they don't probably get the credit that's due because, especially then, what happened at, at the end of the war as, exactly. as well when they weren't included in, in the parades, many exactly. of them weren't able to go home, and those who did had a terrible experience. Exactly, uh, that is something that really shouldn't have happened. It was very unfair, as you said. They had come over. They'd fought, some of them, they fought and gave their lives and to, to the end of the war to just not be given the respect they deserve is just very unfair. Yes, and, it, and the recent movies aside, it's, it is fantastic that the story is getting out and, of course, the collaboration for this aircraft to, to tell those, those stories as well. And the thing, I'm, I'm going to geek out a bit, change because I... I like that there's one here with black and white wings because yeah. it's the you know the the story of the hurricane really is in that battle of France and for those of you of a certain age will remember a TV show called Piece of Cake and a book by Derek Robinson in the book Hornet Squadron is a hurricane squadron and of course come middle 80s there was only four hurricanes flying so you can like yeah. yeah. so you can't you can't make a series about that no. so they used the Spitfire instead they did Dash, which is probably one of the reasons why the Spitfire is so familiar to so many people because there's more of them. And of course, possibly Duxford's most famous resident, MH434, flies under a bridge in that one. She does indeed, yeah. up near Barnard Castle, mm. I presume. Um, I'm guessing Ray Hannah didn't need to test his eyesight though. No, it's, it was a <laughs> Ray's famous line to, to his wingman never fly lower than me. 
Yeah. And that's always good advice when talking about Ray. So what, what's the reaction been? So we, we, we've talked a little bit about the un, unsung bit, but beyond the, we'll call it a minor Twitter storm. <laughs> <laughs> What, what has been the reaction to be? Because you know, we're in here quite early on a, on a cold Friday morning, and there's, there's a good crowd in. There's, you know, of course, my mate annoying everyone with his tripod over there. But what, what's the reaction been like so far? Really positive. People have really enjoyed getting up close to this aircraft. Um, as we were saying earlier, uh, 30 years ago, you would have struggled to find this number of um, airworthy hurricanes full stop to have this number in one place for people to get up close and get to know better is is really quite significant yes and i'm i'm, I'm so happy you've done this because as soon as we we, we walked in um with, with sandy earlier who's been so kind to help put all this together i've had a very big smile on my face it's it's been quite something but we're, we're it's as this is a podcast it's difficult to show my smile and and to talk about the aircraft that are here <laughs> They're hurricanes, ladies and gentlemen. They're absolutely stunning. And we've got five here. We're going to go see the other one a little bit later. But one of the things that is in here with them is the other thing that Duxford have just completed and one we were geeking out about before. And it's tucked. I say tucked. It looms above the aircraft that are in here. And what is that over there? That is our Handley Page Victor uh, the sole surviving B1 uh, variant, uh, although she was uh, converted to a tanker in the late 1960s, she retained her original Bombay, which makes her unique amongst the surviving victors, which of course there aren't many. Uh, we've just completed a five-year restoration of the aircraft. It's been a very detailed aircraft, I'm sure, um, listeners to the podcast who have visited Duckford in recent years will have seen the Victor in various states of undress in uh, the <laughs> conservation <laughs> hangar and then gradually getting dressed again uh, and our conservation team has worked incredibly hard on restoring her and I think she was absolutely fantastic and I'm so pleased that she's finished now as are the conservation team <laughs> I can, I can, after five years I guess. and it's I think it, it's appropriate because we have an incredible selection of very rare beasts in, we do indeed. in this bit so it, it it really does does work because there's the the, the hind and, and and the nimrod and the, the fury here of which there's yeah their hen's teeth let alone having seven yeah. seven yeah. hurricanes here together as well yeah and certainly when we had the official launch as a victor in september last year and we invited a number of victor veterans to watch the veterans walking in here to the conservation hangar and seeing um, the victor. It was a very special moment for me to watch their faces light up. Even some of them, such as Bob Tuxford, who joined us, obviously had experience with the aircraft. That must have been just icing on the cake, especially for the team it that spent so long. It was for for me and for the conservation team. It makes all the hard work seem so worthwhile because it preserving their history mm-hmm. for them. How does it look? It's heaven, isn't it? Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me because it's just uh, oh, it's just absolutely fantastic. I don't get to see it's a rarity to get to see any hurricanes really, but this many together is just um, it's just uh, such a remarkable sight and uh, total pleasure. Yeah, so we're going to have a bit of fun. So we're, we're stood next to B505 and R4118, which are the Hurricane Heritage ones. And just behind them is Historic Aircraft Collections Fury. And what we're going to do is, as we have a wander over there, <laughs> comparing a two-seater which didn't really exist with a Fury, we're just going to talk about that idea that they carried a lot forward from the, the Fury to the Hurricane, this monoplane Fury idea which when you see them next to each other, you can kind of see as complete crud. Exactly. I think, for one thing, the size difference between the two types is is just completely obvious when you you see them in here. The Fury sort of sat behind um, 505. It's a substantially bigger aircraft, the Hurricane, because, you know, a substantially more powerful engine, and it's conceptually similar in its structure, but I think that's where the similarities end. Um, and this idea that you still hear people say, oh, well, Hawkers just took the top wing off the Fury and gave it a retractable undercarriage and then, made, and then that's the hurricane. No, it's, uh, there was a lot of uh, intervening stages before that conclusion. 
And, you know, the, looking at them, you can see can similarities in, in construction, sort of the metal front, fabric back, things like that. But as you were saying, size, the strength need just for the power of the later Kestrel that the, the Hurricane prototype flew with and then the, the, the Merlins that it went through, and it went through quite a few of them. Mm. It couldn't be that same structure. And if we just shoot down that, they took the top wing bit off. The wing on the Hurricane is roughly twice the size of the wing on that Fury, yeah. at least. Absolutely, and it's a different section, it's a different type of structure, um, it's not a braced wing, it's a cantilever wing, you know, and, and given that the, the wing really is the most important bit of any aeroplane, it, it was a complete departure from the, from the Fury, but even the rest of the aircraft. And I think there is this, it, it's, it's understandable, and the, the, the fuselage and the tail and so on of the two aircraft does look pretty similar, but that's partly because Hawker aircraft always took a very evolutionary approach to things. They reused the same shapes a lot. Um, they reused the same sort of types of structure. So if you look even at Hawker aircraft back to the sort of Horsley bomber of the, the sort of mid to late 1920s. Nice niche you know, the, Hawker reference oh, there, mate. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was the, that was the first Hawker aircraft that had this, um, the, the, the bolted up steel tube structure um, that carried all the way through to the Tempest, um, I think I'm right in saying, um, partially in, in, in that aircraft. And this was the, this was one of the beauties of, of Hawker was that they were able to sort of take find these shapes that worked well and just keep reproducing them. But that doesn't mean that the, that the aircraft are the same because they look similar. Yeah, and you know, people, I've I've seen the comments as well that the, the Tempest was quite quite an evolutionary jump because the tail looked different. We actually, if you hmm. take the the little fill, metal fillet off the back of the the Tempest, the the rudder and the, the, the fin is exactly the same as a typhoon and, frankly, a, a hurricane that we're looking at here. Yeah, yeah. And, a, and you can see the evolution because if you look at the original tail on the, uh, the Tornado, the first model of that, which was then found to not be big enough, so they enlarged it for the, uh, the typhoon and then they enlarged the rudder, and then they did the same again on, on the Tempest. They, they took the same shape of tail and made it a bit taller initially for the Tempest and then that wasn't quite big enough so they put that, that dorsal fillet in and you can see the evolution quite clearly it, it, it wasn't a jump in any respect and you know there, there are some actually intervening steps between the Fury and the Hurricane because there was a Goshawk powered private venture aircraft which didn't have a name which was sort of seen, flown in prototype form in, in, the, in the mid 30s which was really a kind of halfway stage to the hurricane uh, fuselage and, and things like that from the an engine installation from the Fury. So it, it wasn't just a, it was never just a jump from the Fury to the Hurricane. There were always there was always this evolution going on um, and innovation happening at various points within it. So the structure of the wing, even the fabric covered wing on the early hurricanes, uh, was quite innovative for a structure of that nature. There were developments in that over and above the, the earlier Hawker fabric covered wings in terms of the way the fabric was attached, um, in terms of the, the, the ribs and the spars and things like that. So it was, um, you know, there was this constant development going on and it was an evolved aircraft. It was not the same aircraft. And you know, the, and the Fury is an absolute, absolutely beautiful aeroplane. Um, it's just the, the epitome of of the biplane fighter, I think. I don't think you'd, you'd ever get a better looking example of, of the interwar fighter, but, uh, you know, that's, that, that's my opinion. You know, you can fight me. Uh, I, I won't, I agree with you. <laughs> and the Hurricane is, is just, again, it's, it's, it, it is beautiful, it's workmanlike, it's, it's um, functional. Uh, it doesn't have any of those those silly curves that take thousands of man hours to, to fashion a single wing. It, it's you know it, it's it's perfection in its way. Especially oh, when there's a load of them together. Yeah. But there we go. So while I have you here, Rebecca, yeah. we have a rare opportunity to talk about how museums work and what your role actually entails and. We were chatting about this before, and one of the questions I was really keen to ask you was about the management of a museum like this. You have so many technical objects under your purview. How do you manage that? Because as, as plane geeks, we sometimes see aircraft being moved around, and we think, well, hang on, we're used to seeing it in that spot over there. 
I know those are decisions that take a lot of time, a lot of effort, and are quite difficult. So in your role, how do you manage your collection? So as Head of Technological Objects, which, uh, which is a great job title because I think I'm the only person in the world with that title, so it's a great um, conversation starter. Um, my role at ISWM is to champion the aircraft and the vehicles and the ordnance and so on and find what is best for them. Mm -hmm. So I will always do, try and do my best for, for the objects. I want them to have the best possible future. Um, so that may involve, say, for example, we talked about the Victor, um, long-term conservation of a very rare Cold War beast. But equally for an aircraft such as the Avenger, we didn't have any long-term plans for the Avenger. And as our policy is to restore and display our large objects as they were operated, as they served, we felt that to try and restore the Avenger as she served with the Canadians in 1950s and 60s. To try and source all the parts we needed would cost so much time and money and sometimes and that's time and money we don't always have so sometimes hard decisions have to be made. So for me um, I would sometimes that the best option is to try and find a, another home within the museum community and I know that upsets um, people quite a bit and I do understand that part of the problems we mentioned earlier we people tend to talk about disposal mm -hmm. they think that means destruction no that very 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 rarely happens uh, for me it's about finding perhaps a new home for an object with a museum that has got the time and the money to spend on it and that's why we're so delighted that the Avenger is going to the Western Approaches Museum up in Liverpool and she's going to become a, a, a real central key feature of their new display. So I, I, I do understand why people get upset. I kind of try and look at it as sharing the love amongst the, <laughs> amongst the museum. Um, I, I said I want what's best for the objects and even though we are a big museum we still have we have constraints on our time we have constraints on our finances obviously Covid didn't help so it's really about just the best best solution. Yes because there, there is finite space and there's a lot of space here but there's only so much to, to go around. We were saying that disposals is possibly a, a traditional name for for that list that yeah. needs needs to change. So I, I prefer dispersals. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's 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 one of those things and you know we were chatting with Sandy earlier about the reaction that that happens. I have been guilty of it yep. before and as I have you here I shall apologize publicly. <laughs> Which but this this is this is why I definitely wanted to talk to you about yep. it because to understand the, the process that goes yeah. into it because it's 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 easy to be sat at home or on the train yeah. board see something pop up and yeah. the immediate reaction is to yeah. question it and it it's not a overnight process um as head of technological objects i might i would take the proposal to a senior team of staff who considers various options and then obviously as a um, major national museum as an, we call an accredited museum um our first choice of home for objects we decide to disperse is another accredited museum. We do our very best to ensure that an, an object will remain on public display. And I, I'm not going to um, pretend that the Avenger isn't quite squeezed in to, in Hangar 3 at the moment. We're doing a lot of object move, um, we've been doing a lot of building work, um, we're still in Hangar 5 and so on. So, yes, to kind of... Um, to best display everything isn't always possible. Yes, <laughs> so the Avenger, hopefully when it goes on display at Western Approaches, will attract and be seen by far more visitors than can really see her at the moment and we'll be able to find out more about the aircraft history. Which is, which is vital because we recently did podcasts on, on the swordfish, we had a whole bit about swordfish Avenger in, yes. in the North Atlantic. Um, Go check that out with Matt Willis, who is still taking photos. He's still wandering around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when that was announced, that was ah, yeah. And I'm I'm pretty sure many people felt a little bit silly about kicking off a bit because 
those lists come out without a lot of context. Yeah. And um, I guess that's that's one one of the things that I know I bang on about quite a lot is yeah. context is key and nuance yeah. is sexy. Yeah, I I I, said, I really do appreciate that people get upset and so it's not a decision we take lightly. A lot of thought and a lot of consideration goes into it. Um, when we make an object available for dispersal, um, we ask inter parties to kind of give us a kind of detailed account of what their plans would be, how they plan to uh, take care of the object, how they plan to display it. And we will sit down and consider all the interested parties' applications and work out from there where we think the most appropriate home is. And we appreciate that there will be museums who apply for objects who would be disappointed but <laughs> it's always the way that you, yeah. can't, you can't make everybody happy no exactly and, exactly and in the age of social media that happy proportion is always a little bit lower than everybody would like exactly exactly so you you said you've got quite a bit going on here at Duxford what's what's the big sort of thing that's exciting you at the moment because I know hang, hang a five is it just about done or is that later in the year? Higher Five is, um, we, ha we, we opened just before Christmas. Um, unfortunately, we're about to close for a few weeks due to some filming taking place here at Duckford, but the hangar will be reopening again in early March. I'm a big fan of the, the new Hangar Five. I think we've got some really great objects in there and I think um, there are certainly a few people surprised to discover what we'd had hiding away in the workshop and then moved into Hangar 5 such as the RSO and the Kubelwagen mm -hmm. and the Staghound yes. of course and the Crusader too so it's been great fun to walk into the hangar and see visitors reaction to those and uh, yeah, the conservation team they're making good progress already and of course the Shackleton mm -hmm. as well Gordon our conservation officer has been very busy um, stripping the paint <laughs> off um, the last couple of weeks so yeah Hangar 5 for me and kind of our kind of ongoing conservation program I think it it's pretty exciting. It's uh, obviously the Victor had um, taken up the lion's share of the conservation team for the past kind of, five years. Now they have the opportunity to work on a few different projects, and I think visitors are going to enjoy seeing what we do. So I'm now going to ask you the surface choice question. You <laughs> are the head of technological objects for the IWM. Yep. If you could take one home, if you had the space, what would you? sneak out in the back of your car? I would definitely sneak out or tow behind me the Hawker Hunter Ooh. in Hangar 4 because um, Tifa Tango, as she's known um, by myself and the uh, some of the Duckford veteran, uh, actually served here at Duckford in the late 1950s. So she, she's home as far as I'm concerned, so she's definitely a favourite. Can I, can I take a second one home with me? Yeah, sure, go on. Okay, Tornado GR1, um, oh, yes. uh, Foxy Killer um, in the Gulf War. I have a lot of love for her. I actually grew up near Cottesmore, mm -hmm. um, and our house was right in the flight path of Cottesmore. So um, in the 1980s, early 90s, the tornado flying over constantly was the soundtrack of my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So, yes, you, you will, we'll only allow you two. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll nick the... He, Sitting here, surrounded by beautiful hawkers. You've already got the hunter, so I'll take the CF 101 that's hanging next door because I do, I do, I do like the. You have to get it down first. I know. <laughs> it might be a bit, bit noisy. Um, so there's just checking through my notes. You've still got events happening around the exhibition. We uh, have indeed. We have our evening exhibition opening uh, where the aircraft will be lit up all different colours. So a great opportunity to bring your camera and. Uh, it's, the aircraft in a different light and um, details available on the website um, and also towards the end of the exhibition February the 18th we have an all-day um, series of lectures here from various people associated with the hurricane including pilots, uh, ground crew and one of the museum curators as well. Not me this time, <laughs> I'm just in charge of introductions. <laughs> so again, um, tickets are still available, so please do check out our website and come and join us if you can. And it's, I think one of the speakers is Nicholson VC's grandson. Isn't he? he is indeed, yes. yes. So an opportunity to find out a bit more about the uh, first uh, Hurricane pilot to be awarded the uh, Victoria Cross, and I think the only the pilot... The only fighter in... command pilot, yes. yes.
Indeed. Yes. And if you want to hear about another pilot who maybe should have been one in another Hawker aircraft who was killed on attack on a radar site, see me, because um, that's a fun story. So I'm gonna, we're going to wrap up our chat here. We're going to do a little geeking out with Hurricanes. But you have a competition going for the exhibition. We do indeed. Um, opportunity to... As we're standing next to BE 505. Yeah, if you want to take a flight in the only two-seater hurricane in the world, um, this exhibition is your opportunity to do so. So do come along. And so this is going to be going out towards the middle end of January, which means there's about a month left before everybody goes we home. We close on February the 19th, so... 20th of February, they, they'll all be moving on, so you must come by the 19th to see them. So, when when this goes out, the Sea Hurricane will have arrived. That's coming tomorrow as we record. Unfortunately, we, we did dash up, hopefully, that it was going to be today. Yes, but unfortunately, we, we had hoped she'd be arriving this morning, but no, she's due in tomorrow morning, so we'll have a little bit of a shuffle around in the hangar. And obviously, we're another hurricane short at the moment, because uh, V 7497 is currently over that way in the hangar having some maintenance work done we're hoping by the end of next week we'll have all seven in here for visitors to enjoy and ladies and gentlemen do come because it's fantastic to see them all together rebecca thank you so much for your time You're very welcome i cannot thank rebecca greenwood harding enough for welcoming us to iwm duxford to have a look around the hurricane unsung hero exhibition and also to sandy davidson from the iwm who helped quarterback and put all of this together they were both ace for helping us out. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about at the end of this podcast, and I've not scripted this because I want to speak from the heart, is how we react to things that come up at the institutions that we love and also the institutions that can kind of infuriate us. The IWM, the RAF Museum, other places where some of our favorite objects are cared for, we can, as aeroplane fans, enthusiasts, whatever we want to call ourselves, AV geeks, can get a little precious over the things that are there. Now, recently, for example, I've been bleating on about the B-25 that was disposed of, doing air quotes, from the RF Museum, which is now up at East Links. It's going to be running, it's going to be great, but I was on my high horse because the disposal list said that it was not relevant to the RAF. As we've seen from talking to Rebecca, there is a lot more considerations that go into these decisions of dispersal and sharing these items and objects out around the country. Now, this is something I've been thinking about ever since we were up at Duxford. And there's been a few occasions over the last few years, especially during lockdown when we had nothing better to do, but Google things and complain. And in one particular case, things went a bit far and one individual received threats that are completely beyond the pale. And I can understand and I can completely get on board with the passion that the AV geek community has towards aircraft and their history. I just wanted to say at the end of this that we have to measure how our passions come across, especially through the medium of social media. What we feel and what we care about are important. That's what keeps these institutions going. But at the same time, we don't always understand the decisions that go into making the choices that they do. I work for a very big organization and I would not expect you to come after me if one of our exhibitions didn't work out too well. I'm just one of the guys in IT. Likewise, some of the curators and some of the teams at places like the Imperial War Museum are slightly more front and center to the decisions that are made, um, perhaps at higher levels and for changes of tact that they are not privy to. So what am I trying to say here? If something happens that you do not agree with, ask the question, why is this happening by all means? reach out through proper channels, but for the love of all that's holy, do it in a sensible and constructive way. Criticism is there for a reason and it can be constructive. It can also be damaging, it can also be hurtful, and if we're not careful, can affect the people that are in place 
to look after the things that we care about. So I've left my conversation with with Rebecca and the, and the team up at Duxford really thinking about the way I need to approach a lot of the things that are going on. And one of the things I want to do with the Damcasters is to speak to heads of museum and curators about what they actually do so that we as fans and geeks and whatever you want to call us can get a better understanding of how these things work. Now, I am going to come out and say it. I do have some concerns and issues with some of the wider aspects at IWM, but I'd love to sit down and discuss those concerns with the relevant people there. I do hope that this visit is a way that we can start that conversation because I think there's an opportunity for understanding on both sides. The same goes for the RAF Museum. I have no clue what the RAF Museum's strategy 2030 vision thing actually says because it is management gobbledygook. But exactly the same invitation is open to them as well. If they'd like to come on the show or even if it is just to meet and discuss things and talk about what that vision is, I would love to be able to help people understand what they're on about because it impacts us as visitors and fans and supporters of their sites. I'd love to speak to you about these things. Help us all have a better understanding of what the future holds for these institutions that we hold so very dear. And as such, I'm going to be reaching out to, to see if I can make that happen. There will be an upcoming episode, which I can't really talk about at the moment, which is going to look at the US side of these things and see how things work over there versus here, private institutions versus national ones. There's more to these beasts than meets the eye. And especially when we are online, dear listener, we need to moderate our language and the discourse around this between each other at the very bottom level, but also to those who are in positions in these institutions doing jobs that frankly, we'd all love. You know, if Rebecca decides to retire, you know, give me a ring. But we need to make sure that we are being supportive. And that can be through constructive criticism and asking questions around decisions, but not by making threats and also attacks on the individuals themselves. We need to do better. And when we walk around places like Duxford, Hendon, these places hold incredible objects. And it's strange, you know, walking around the hurricane exhibition, we're getting very passionate about weapons of war that are designed to kill people. And yet people kind of forget that and then channel things that they would never say in polite conversation elsewhere. The passion that we have as fans and aviation enthusiasts is one that never ceases to blow me away. It is a remarkable community. The knowledge, the passion, and the time that people put in to make sure that these stories of pilots, aircrew, maintainers, men, women of all stratas of class, color, sexual orientation, whatever you want to think about, is incredible. And I don't want to see that change. But I think how we go about it and how we share and how we discuss these things that we love, we can do that a bit better. So I'm going to wrap this up now and just say thank you for listening to me ramble on a bit, which is quite unkeeping for this podcast, I'm sure. But this is just what's on my mind. And it's something that we will be coming back to the show. If you don't like it, that is entirely your prerogative. I'm sure people will get in touch with me about these thoughts. But this is, this is just me. This is what I want to say on this teeny tiny platform that I have. And that I am going to look at how I do things, how I go about it, how I communicate. And hopefully, maybe we can have conversations that lead to the sort of change that we want to see in the institutions that we love. That can only be a good thing. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone. 
and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.